Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. This week my guest is Eric Potts. We talk about life as a dame, life on the cobbles of Coronation Street, and that famous balloon routine he does. So please, sit back and enjoy the latest Panto Podcast. My guest for today's podcast is Mr. Eric Potts. Hello there, sir. Hi, Hayden. <laughs> so I'm meeting you here in Keswick, mm. in the Theatre by the Lake. Yeah. Um, small little theatre. What What are you doing here then, exactly, at the moment? Uh, I'm doing the, the summer season, which uh, bizarrely runs until November the 2nd. It's like um, it's like Blackpool with the illuminations. Mm. Uh, and we're doing uh, rep theatre, good old rep theatre. We're doing um, three different productions. Uh, I'm in all the three plays in the main house. There's also a studio theatre there that has three separate productions. I don't think they let me in the studio because it's not big enough. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're having a great time and doing really well business-wise, enjoying it. Three great plays, lovely place to spend the summer, getting a whole load of writing done while I'm up here and things. So, yeah, it's, it's great. been here since April and we've got, so we're recording this when middle September. So, yeah, another seven or eight weeks to go. Excellent. And fun. Three plays in one week. Yeah, two nights each. Um, so we, we're doing, uh, we did an adaptation of Uncle Vanya by um, Alan Aikborn called Dear Uncle last night. We've got another one of them tonight. Then we do matinee and evening and a Friday night show of The Lady Killers. And then on Saturday we do The Rise and Fall of Little Voice, which we did on Monday. So each each show gets two or three, if there's a matinee, uh, performances a week. But it changes each week what night. They're up. We turn up, <laughs> see what costumes have been set out, and that's what we put on. <laughs> so, <laughs> glutton for punishment then, <clears throat> three shows mm. and writing. What is it you're writing then? So I have, uh, pleased to say, uh, given that it's September, uh, I've finished all my uh, panto scripts. So I've been writing nine Panto scripts this year uh, for different companies and a couple of um, amateur ones as well, which have now all gone out. I am just doing some rewrites on the script for a new jukebox musical, which will be touring next autumn, which I'm directing. Uh, I won't say too much about that, but it's going to be great fun. Um, so just yeah, a few little tweaks still to do on that, and then that'll be finished. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, it's been great. I mean, it's such a beautiful place to work. Uh, Keswick up in the lakes so I've been taking my little um, iPad out sitting by the lake and tapping away and I think I'm sure this is how Wordsworth did it but possibly without the iPad Pro uh, so it's been, it's been great and I sort of ummed and ahed about spending seven months up here um, but it was my wife that said well, just have a year where you're not dashing about quite as much on the motorways and all the rest and I have to say it's it's been great yeah what got you started then in theatre um, well, I, I had a really good um, drama teacher at my secondary school um, up in Scotland. I was born and bred in Ayrshire on the west coast of Scotland. And um, she was a wonderful teacher, really inspiring. We did loads of great um, school productions. And she said, well, you should audition for the National Youth Theatre, which I'd never heard of. So I... Um, Audition for that, managed to uh, bluff my way through that and got into the National Youth Theatre. Spent a few summers in, in London, in Chalk Farm, and doing productions there, and then at the Shaw Theatre um, down in Euston with the National Youth Theatre, and just had the most fantastic experience. And I learned so much, not just about theatre, but about people, about life, about respect, about all sorts of things. I, I you know, look back at it, and almost immediately, even as a, a teenager, I looked back and I thought, oh, God, yeah, I would never have thought that about, you know, that person. Or I would never have approached that topic in that way. So I learned so much from it. It was great. And then um, then I kind of decided, OK, that was great. Um, but I sort of talked myself uh, into being a lawyer and was all set to go to Glasgow University. And um, I thought, you know what? I, I'm actually going to spend the rest of my life saying, what if? Uh, so the university um, put the place on hold for a year and I went and auditioned for a few drama college and uh, didn't get into a few and got into a couple, one of which was Bristolovic Theatre School. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a go. And uh, and now I'm spending seven months in Keswick. <laughs> So, <laughs> and every Christmas and every Christmas, yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, it's been great. So lucky um, to be kept busy, um, and you know, 
being, being able to, to pay the gas bill doing something that I love. When you were younger then, what sort of theatre were you taking part in? What sort of plays? Uh, professionally, mm. you mean, after after college? After college, yeah. After college. So, I mean, obviously there was, um, I mean, even in my, what, 30 years doing this malarkey now, the, the number of regional reps has reduced. So there was a lot of, of regional rep work. Um, I started a rep at Oldham Coliseum, did a, a season there, which was wonderful. And really it sort of decided where we, my wife and I, um, set up our home because we were both up in Scotland. But I, I needed to be in London on a semi-regular basis for castings and work. And um, we moved down to, to near Oldham, up in the hills, where kind of we still are. We've moved slightly further afield, but we're in north of Manchester area. Um, I did. I used to do uh, a few tours for the wonderful David Wood um, at that time, it was the Whirly Gig Theatre Company for children's um, theatre, but it was the big venues. It was the opera houses and the hippodromes and Sadler's Wells and things. And we'd tour around the country doing a week in each of these places, um, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. shows. Uh, and it was, again, a huge learning experience, but but great fun. And it was, it was so enjoyable because the product was so strong and um, written with so much integrity and, and respect for the, the, the audience and the age of the audience. And we're sort of talking from five-year-old, six-year-old up. Um, and he David still does write wonderful plays that looks at the world from a children's point, a child's point of view. And um, it was great. We really enjoyed that. You know, hard work. And that you, you were made, I remember, you 9 a.m. warm-up which is unheard of for you know, actors, 9 a.m., are you sure? <laughs> and we had to drink uh, half a glass of um, watered-down honey and cider vinegar to protect our voices, and that was part of the, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it was in the contract, but it was part of the deal. Oh, it was horrible. But it seemed to work. I don't think many of us got it. So yeah, it was all that sort of work. Um, small parts in television. Um, played my first part in Corrie the year after I left college. It was a, a solicitor for um, uh, Alec Gilroy, Roy Barraclough, mm. um, who was, I think, going through a, a sort of divorce thing with Bet at the time. So, yeah, all, all these sort of things. And, and again, luckily, very busy, but it was predominantly rep-based. So you'd be travelling all over the country, Edinburgh and Chester and Leatherhead and all sorts of places. Just going back there, you said about writing the script, or the scripts that you were reading were, um, they were very respectful from five-year-olds upwards. Mm. Do you find that yourself now when you're writing your own scripts to make it inclusive? and Oh, totally, totally. Um, it, it's got to be because they are the hardest audience to uh, not only please but to convince because if they see a flaw either in the script or in a character, they'll pick up on it immediately. Oh, but she doesn't look scared. Why is she laughing? This is terrible. He's about to take the cottage from them, but she's like, you know, they've really got to believe it. And they let you know as well, don't oh, they? Oh, crikey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you've got to, everything, I, my belief, certainly when I'm, I'm writing and directing Panto and, and appearing in it, um, is that everything has to have an underlying credibility. Even the most ridiculous nonsense, you're standing there with two dancers in a cow costume. If you don't believe that that is a cow then they won't believe. Mm. And it's the most important thing in the world uh, because everything has got to matter to them. And they can laugh at it and they can have fun. <laughs> We're stymied if they don't laugh at it. <laughs> but if they don't believe what you are telling them, then you're, you're, you're not doing it right. Did you go to Panto many times as a child? Oh, yeah. Uh, again, brought up on the west coast of Scotland. So we <clears throat> were kind of spoiled. Our closest venue was the beautiful little gaiety theatre in air. Uh, and wonderful Johnny Beatty was uh, always the dame there. Wonderful pantos. And then we would go up to the Kings in Glasgow and see Stanley Baxter, Ricky Fulton, Una McLean, all the wonderful Scottish names uh, in the panto up there, which was a real experience. You know, big show, big orchestra, um, 16 dancers, all that. It was wonderful. And I, yeah, fond memories every year of going going to both. And I, I remember going, we had school trips to Panto as well, to the Civic Theatre in Air, which was a converted church. And it was only years later that I found out that those were actually amateur 
it was an amateur group and uh, obviously was the cheapest option for the school for the mm. school at the time but again great memories of them i still remember the felt hat routine i think i must have seen it when i was i don't know six or seven and i still remember <laughs> that's where i first heard it you know um it's a felt hat oh yeah i felt that and you know it's all it's all still in there and they they uh, so I think it's sure still getting used somewhere today. Do you ever include little bits in your own? Oh yeah, I think you you know you know you 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 know what works, and it's it's the thing about Panto. I think narratively, um, you you make your own choices and you write it the way you want. You put the gags in you want, but I think the thing with Panto is you know parents take their kids or grandparents take their kids to see a Panto. And they've got one eye on the stage and one eye on the kids. And if the kids aren't getting the same joy and the same experience that they got 25 or 50 or whatever years earlier, then there is an element of disappointment. So you have to include the opportunities for shouting, the call and responses. You have to include the routines. And people have tried to be clever with Panto, saying, oh, no, no, we're going to update it. It's going to be modern, cutting edge. And it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And there's, you know, I'm not saying there isn't space for that in, in family entertainment. But I think if you're advertising something as a panto, people recognise what they're going to get with that. And it doesn't mean that it has to be the same each year. And it doesn't mean that you can't explore wonderful 3D opportunities that are coming along and audio visuals and pyros and all that, of course. Um, because <coughs> the kids are spending a lot of the the time on their xboxes and things and if it doesn't match up with what they can get mm. on there they think, oh god can't wait to get back to grand theft Auto. <laughs> but they you know so it's got to be appealing but the bottom line is it's got to be quality storytelling and on my desk at home not that i've been there for a while <laughs> uh, uh i have a um, i used to have a piece of laminated paper on my wall above my computer uh but um a few years ago, um, I was given a gift of a, a lovely paperweight, a lovely round piece of beautiful wood uh, on which a little gold plaque, and it says the word adventure. And that's all it says, because Panto has got to be an adventure. And if for at least half, I would think probably about 60% of the show, if the kids aren't metaphorically, shall we say, holding on to the seat in front of them, wondering what's happening next and caring about what they're seeing, then it, I don't think it's right. On that adventure hook, you can hang your comedy, your routines, your songs, all the visuals you like, but if, unless it is an adventure that is taking those 200, 500, 2,000 kids, family members with it, then it's, I don't think it's proper panto. Do you find yourself watching from the wings? Yes, very much. I mean, most of the time <clears throat> when I'm in Panto, I've directed it as well. Um, so obviously lots of different hats going on there. But when I can, I'm watching from the wings. If I can't watch from the wings, I'm listening on the tannoy. And you, you, you think, oh, hang on, I'll just change that. I'll just remind him that, that that's why that was there or, you know, all that. Mm. But yeah, you've got to. And it, you know, it's hard work. We're doing two shows a day um, for six weeks, five weeks, whatever. And um, the temptation is to have a little smirk with one of the dancers or something. But if if a kid sees that, then you've blown you've blown that belief, you've blown that credibility. And again, I'm not saying that Panto shouldn't be fun. We've got to be enjoying it mm. for anyone else to enjoy it. Um, but if we can do that without in any way belittling the product or undermining the importance of the story we're telling, however ridiculous it is then that's that's the way forward that's the way forward um so uh yeah it's it's quality storytelling that's what it has to be and on that we hang the traditional panto elements have you found yourself with your direct hat even when you're not directing the certain pantomime you still have to sort of take charge of it and yeah have to keep people focused uh, yes i do and i you know it's it's um it's a, it's a tricky situation because when you are directing it you're you're in it and you want to enjoy it. You mm. want to have the same process of of actually, you know, being part of people's festive season and enjoying that. But you're always, you know, if I'm standing there dressed as Shirley Temple or whatever I am, you know, as, in a Dane costume, I've always got half an eye out for. Oh, hang on, why hasn't that cloth come in there? 
or that didn't sound quite right. I'll talk to the MD about that later, you know. Um, and uh, just keeping an eye on things and saying, oh, that pause has got a bit long. So you, you've always got to do that. And I find, to be honest, you when I'm not directing it, I'm not directing this year in, in Manchester, where I'm going to be playing Nurse and Snow White for QDOS, um, uh, which I'm quite looking forward to not directing, actually. It'd be quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else do all the worry. Um, but, yeah, you know, you always do listen out for things, and you think, oh, I'll make that better, or oh, I wonder if I should mention that, or something, you know, without stepping on people's toes. Mm. It's, it's not about sort of becoming some kind of tin pot dictator in a frock. Uh, but <laughs> it uh, it's just about keeping it right. But yeah, it's it's first year in a while I've not directed the panto I'm in. Um, uh, I got offered lovely Jonathan Kylie at Kudos uh, offered me a, a an option of directing and daming at another venue, which I won't mention, or uh, just daming at Manchester because they've got the wonderful Guy Unsworth who has been directing it, and of course uh, Manchester is travelable. Uh, from home for me mm. so I thought oh Christmas at home I'll have that <laughs> <laughs> right then going right the way back mm. your very first time on the boards did you find it very nerve wracking and do you still get the nerves now um, yes I did um, but I have to say I, I do less these days um, but I think perhaps less nerves but certainly an equal level of awareness, um, an awareness of what's going on round about you, an awareness of potential problems or issues or trips mm. or, and you know, you sort of think, oh, yeah, I must remember there's a little lip on that step. I don't want to go uh, flat my face. So you, there is an awareness and um, uh, I'm trying to find another word that's slightly less than, than first night nerves or first few nights nerves um but i remember yes i think as everyone certainly young and early in their careers there is that real nervousness and the old um, butterflies in the stomach uh which i get much less these days but just an awareness of what's going on around about you but it is, does happen though, oh these yeah. Days. yeah 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 and i think i think i think when you you stop feeling that heightened level of mm. you know um adrenaline then maybe it's time to you know go and do something else because you've lost the buzz and that that's what it is the buzz and it's I think it really is about just doing your best to fulfil the the audience's wishes you know they've they've come to see the show they've probably spent quite a bit of money to be there and you just want to get it right and get it as as good as you can for them and I think the day that you stop feeling that and thinking all oh, right let's get this done um, then probably time to to move on. What about then when the family come along to see you? Yes. Does, does that fill you with terror sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps less now than it did. I remember when my daughters were young. Um, there's a lovely story I had when I used to do panto at the Oldham Coliseum and I was playing dame and my youngest daughter, Isla, uh, came with her school to see the show. Because they always came mm. you know, with the family, but this was the school panto that they came to see. And... Um, there was a lovely story about one of Isla's friends turning to their teacher at the interval going, Miss, Isla says that woman's her dad. And <laughs> there's a lot of argument, I think, went on. Um, but it, um, I still enjoy them coming to see it. Um, they've heard all my gags, all my material, 50 times so they can recite it. I'm working here at Keswick with a lovely stage manager, uh, Catherine, who has... Uh, stage managed pantos that I've written for the past I think eight nine years and damn it I'm using my material you know as a laugh around the green room and she's reciting it with me because she's heard it all before <laughs> so uh yeah the family is great when they come um and I think they still enjoy it mm. I think <laughs> what, are you, what are your favorite panto gags then um, favorite Ooh. panto routines that you like to take part in I think um I think the drill routine in uh, Dick Whittington can still be very very funny um i mean the basis is there and i think if you've got a good comic that can maybe ever so slightly tweak it and make it their own um while still involving everyone else um is great i'm thinking uh, as i'm speaking of of lovely andy ford 
um, who's been doing Plymouth the past few years. Oh, actually, I think he's in, is he in Dartford this year? I think he I is. Think he, I is, think he is in Dartford. But I, I worked with Andy, and Andy did um, Bristol Hippodrome for us at, at First Family for many years. And I did Dick Whittington down there with him, and he made that drill routine his own, you know, but still involving <coughs> everyone else, and that was lovely. Um, I think a really good version of If I Were Not Upon the Stage or If I Were Not In Old Peking, whatever the mm. version, can be hugely effective, can be a real showstopper. But the thing, again, my own personal belief about routines like that and the 12 days is that they have to be organised chaos but the key word is organised because if it just becomes a free-for-all with everyone trying to get the laughs and trying to mess up everyone else then the audience lose the focus that is necessary for them to be made to look in the right places at the mm. right time and I've seen versions that you know the, the, the laughter will start and grow and then as it just degenerates into everyone trying to outdo each other you lose the audience and it's being done for the wrong reason. It's being done for the people on stage rather than mm. for the people in the auditorium. So I think it has to be, um, it has to look chaotic, but it has to be organised chaos. And that's when I think you'll get the biggest laughs and the most respect because certainly with it, if I were not upon the stage, when it's done well mm. and you have those wonderful moves where people are missing being hit by a bucket of water or whatever, <laughs> in, it, you know, by millimetres, it just works an absolute treat. And the audience look forward. To, they know it's going to happen mm. again in the next verse and after that and after that. And if it doesn't, if people start messing about, the audience get disappointed. You go, oh, Oh, I, was, oh, I wanted that to happen again, and then see what that triggered with the next person. You know, the, mm. the old, and the, it's why we do it. These are decades old, centuries old, some of them, vaudevillian routines, and we only do them because they're great routines. But if we start messing about with them, they become less great. Looks tiring. It is. It is. Yeah, I um, I, my family um, always say I go into my post panto coma in January, um, where my ankles get back down to a normal size and, and all the rest of it. Uh, it is tiring, but you, I like to think that we are part of so many families' Christmas, and it's, it's part of their routine. You know, we do this, we open presents at this time, we have turkey, we go to the panto, blah, blah, blah. It's part of their annual routine. Um, and that kind of gets you through the, the tiredness. And, you know, I think I'd be lying and I think every other panto performer in the country would think I was uh, not being truthful I said you know there are Thursday afternoons we it's the last thing you want to do uh, oh god right get these boots on and you know get the boobs on or whatever <laughs> so you know you do you do feel um drained but it, it it's hugely rewarding it's hugely rewarding the the pantos that and the, they're becoming fewer and fewer as the shape of Christmas, perhaps predominantly commercially, is changing. The, the shape of Panto is changing, of course, where it used to start on Boxing Day or Christmas Eve and run right through. I mean, some used to run through to Easter. I can remember, remember the Pavilion and the Kings in Glasgow running right through into March, April sometimes, um, which doesn't happen very often. But I've done a few that have just maybe gone into February. And that's when it gets really hard, when all the lights have been taken down, everyone's back at work, <laughs> and you're still singing, on the eighth day of Christmas. <laughs> you think, oh, God, get, get me out of this. Send you into a Grinch a little bit, <laughs> yes. But you're only, you know, it, those shows, you're only doing it because, it, again, it's still popular, it's still busy, and um, still part of people's festive season. So what was your first, then, role in pantomime? In proper panto i'd done like a couple of christmas shows because uh, it took me a few years after leaving college to get into panto uh but i was on tour um with i'm trying to remember i think it was a stage production of the witches roll Dahl, which one of david wood's mm. adaptations big show and i was at theater or nottingham and I had been auditioned at college by Kenneth Allen Taylor, who at the time was artistic director of Nottingham Playhouse. And I thought, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. It's a bit late. I think it was August. I'm going to drop a line in at stage door, just a little note, uh, and say, look, 
I don't know if there's anything in Panto, but I'd love to be considered. I don't know if you remember me from Bristol or Vic. And I dropped this in at stage door, and uh, two days later I got a call from my agent at the stage door at the theatre, you know, when, before we all walked around with mobiles dictating our lives, um, <clears throat> saying you've been offered uh, the role of Baron Hardup in Cinderella at Nottingham Playhouse. And I went and did that, and had a great time, ended up doing the next two years, uh, the following year I think was Dick Whittington, where I played uh, Alderman Fitzwarren. It was all kind of, you know, the old men's parts, and I think I was 27 at the time. <laughs> So it's not looking good, uh, and then we did Mother Goose the year after uh, with with Ken. Uh, Ken had had written it and directed it, and of course was the the dame, a wonderful, wonderful dame. And I that is basically who taught me the art of daming was Kenneth Allen Taylor. Um, and then when he left Nottingham, <clears throat> he said, "Well, do you want to stay here um, and dame after I've gone, or would you like to come to Oldham um, and I'll be writing and directing." it but I won't be daming and I thought well, you know what again I can work from home at Oldham lovely though Nottingham Playhouse is um, so I, I then went on and did uh, well crikey a good few years as, as dame or ugly sister um, at Oldham with Kenneth directing and did that fit you better as a person to be dame yes yeah uh, I mean I obviously you know I was the first three years I really was learning the art and it is just soaking it all up going all oh, right that's what happens and oh yeah i mean it's such so obvious now but at the time you go all oh, right so the baddie only comes on from stage left all oh, right oh, yeah, you know um and uh yeah that that's really when i sort of learned the art and honed the the character of of my dame if you like without sounding pompous about it um that's where she kind of came to fruition. And a lot of it was based on what I saw Kenneth doing as Dame and saying, well, how can I make that mine? How can I make that my own? Or what would what would my take on that be? Um, but he certainly was my mentor. When it came to things from home, did you bring anything in from the family? You know, aunts, mum? Yeah, a bit of... Grandma, um, stuff like that. Yeah, I think I think there probably was more grandma <laughs> uh, rather than, than mum because, you know, there's those wonderful old... Um, my my dame is very much, a, you know, an old sort of older, cuddly mm. uh, type granny. And I always say, I always say uh, when people say, what what is it about dame? And I say, well, obviously there's lots of different ways of doing it, different approaches, different styles, all of which are fine. But my dame, as if she stood at the front door of the theatre at the end of the show, every kid should want to come up and give her a hug because she's just like their third granny and they feel safe and comfy and amused. Um, so that that's kind of the style. And I think, although, you know, I was brought up in Scotland, I very rarely got a chance to do a Scottish dame. I'd done uh, one up in Glasgow at the King's, which was great, getting to use my native accent. I was going to say, um, where's the accent actually gone? Yeah. Oh, well, if, you know, if my wife and my brothers were to phone me now, it'd be, oh, hiya, how are you doing? Oh, hi. Oh, it's fine here. <laughs> oh, yeah. hi. Another seven weeks. No, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I do. But I find, I've always said I find it more difficult to maintain my native accent when I'm not hearing it. <clears throat> um, my father was English, and, uh, so I was brought up with always an English tone and um, training down in Bristol and things that was kind of thumped out me. Uh, but the minute I go home, when I'm at home with the family, I'm Scottish, because that's what I'm hearing, because uh, my wife's from Kilmarnock, where I'm off in a few weeks to direct Cinderella, which is one of the pantos I write for Imagine Theatre. Um, and when they said a few years ago, they said, oh, do you want to write and direct Kilmarnock at the Palace Theatre? I went, oh, crikey, yeah, because I used to go, Palace Theatre is one of those venues that has a, a hall and a theatre and I used to go to Christmas parties at the Grand Hall organised by my, my father's um, work factory where he, he worked and used to go to the kids Christmas parties there. so actually to be directing the panto in the same building oh, is that was a real, full circle, yeah I know it? it's lovely <laughs> how do you find then Scottish audiences compared to English audiences to write for um, again it's very and you you do find this in specific English venues as well but they they like their own 
you know, uh, there's wonderful stories about English performers going up to appear, even as baddies in Scottish pantomimes and really not having a great time. Uh, Les Dennis, lovely Les, he told a story. We went and did the Kings one year. And, you know, despite his best efforts, <laughs> he wasn't hugely appreciated <laughs> because Scottish audiences like to go and see Scottish performers and they like their own um, routines and their own specifically Scottish humour. Uh, so I'm very, very lucky in that I'm able to write that, having been brought up with it. Um so you know it, it, it's uh, it's fine for a dame to call her son a glicket tube, you know. <laughs> Whereas down here, exactly, <laughs> I'm, I've got a puzzled look on my face, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> a numpty, an idiot, ah, <laughs> yeah, glicket tube. <laughs> so yeah, that's fine. But if you were to call him a, a silly numpty, it wouldn't get the laugh that it it does. And that, and and similarly down south, I'm thinking of places like Liverpool and Stoke. As well, they like very local humour, um, which I think is great. I think each panto should have a sense of local ownership, and the audience shouldn't sit there and think, "Oh, well, this was in Sunderland last year, and they haven't changed it, or it could go anywhere." You know, they have to think this is our panto. And when I was writing the scripts for for, for First Family, I um, <coughs> excuse me, I got on great terms with the marketing departments at most theatres. And I'd phone up and say, is the bus station built built yet? And they go, no, no. I'll go, all right, we'll get that in. Still no bus station in Stoke. Or, and they say, oh, but we've got a Starbucks. That's all oh, right, Starbucks. That's, you know. <laughs> so you'd, you'd write uh, specifically for each venue, uh, not only local colloquialisms, you know, not only the aop me docs or yara mm. la or whatever it is. <laughs> you, you would write stuff that a local audience would recognise about the pedestrianisation or a local councillor that, you know, had been caught stealing fruit from the market, whatever it was, you, you would you would write that. And people would go, oh, that's about here, that's great, that's ours, that's ours. And that ha adds very much, I think, to each uh, audience's um, appreciation of the show. Going back earlier on, you said you played Ugly Sister. Mm. Did you like being a baddie? No. If I'm honest, uh, it's a very different art form, and I, I really admire um, the uglies that, that do it well, of which there are many. Um, I, I found it because I enjoyed the comedy moments, you know, and there are some great comedy moments within the uh, Ugly Sisters track. But the old tearing up of the invitation to the ball, the nasty elements, and being booed, I didn't enjoy as much. And there are some, some wonderful performers that can really sell that and get the comedy as well. Hmm. But in all honesty, I, I felt that I wasn't one of them. I wasn't doing that justice. I don't know. Other people can do the, the nasty side better than me. Um, so um, I thought, well, I did, it, I did it a couple of times up at Oldham. I think it was only ever at Oldham I did Ugly. And I've been asked a couple of times since to do it, but I thought, no, I do prefer... The dame, and it's not about uh, having to share the comedy and thing. You know, that's mm. uglies will work beautifully off each other, and that's great. That's fine. I'm certainly not um, against anything like that. It's just the fact that you are you are basically the Abenazas of the of the piece, and I wasn't that keen on that. And you never fancied becoming an Abenazar? No, no. I I think I'll do a few more years with the. Uh, with the frocks, um, I d yeah, no, I think again, I think uh, there are some remarkably good baddies out there that kind of do year on year, and they do it so well. Um, but yeah, I don't know, if, I don't know if I'm going to be one of them. What was it like then putting on the frock for the first time? Um, yeah, again, a big <laughs> learning curve. I uh, had been taught well, and the rehearsals for that particular show were great because I was being guided all the time. But I, I, I did, without sounding arrogant, I think I had a confidence about what I was going to do. I was <laughs> more than happy to have been proved wrong. Luckily, it, it wasn't the case. Uh, I, felt, um, I felt able, shall we say, to, to do it, um, which I think is uh, there's that very fine line between arrogance and confidence, and I hope I'm coming down on the confidence side of it, um, because I felt confident that I would be able 
to carry this particular character off. And I felt a certain amount of responsibility um, because I was becoming just a very, very small part of the most incredible British tradition. And I wanted to be, a, a, you know, a good part of that tradition as opposed to a, a poor part. Um, and I, I enjoyed it. I very quickly found my my character and you know it was tweaked and altered and oh yeah I won't do that and that's a bit that doesn't work as strongly or so you 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 tweak and adapt um which I did relatively quickly uh, if I'm remembering correctly and uh I just enjoyed it just enjoyed her um and I'm always happy to uh hang up the the frocks at the end of January or whatever uh <laughs> The boots, the, the break on the stage. Exactly. I'm sure. Oh, oh! Last year in Darlington, uh, we did um, Aladdin, and I, I don't remember feeling it as bad the year before when I was also in Darlington. They got a lovely rake there, and oh, I, I thought calves only a cow could love. It, <laughs> it was, um, yeah. But um, yeah, so it's always good to hang them up. But I'm always thinking, yeah, we'll do that again next year. Because you just said to me before we started recording that in the boot of the car, yes. you had to, there's even a pair of Dame's boots. And yeah, it's I, think just, it's about, I think it's about eight eight pairs just literally underneath me as I'm sitting here. I'd been changing my car over, so I had to empty the car out <laughs> yesterday, and they took that one away, and I'm not getting my new one until next week. So, yeah, I've got my boots here and shoes and uh, much to the amusement of my colleagues up here in Keswick. He said I should be playing this 1920s uh, Lake District Squire as uh, with a pair of orange boots on, <laughs> which I think would be lovely. How do you take the criticism from other actors about and degrading pantomime? Do you, have you ever found that as well? Uh, yeah, yes, I think I think. Um, Not saying this production, <clears throat> but just yeah, just how people can be a bit snobby about pantomime. They they can, and you know, I always think well, you know, people have to uh, be allowed to have their opinions, of course. But I think it's then down to us to, in the nicest possible way, prove them wrong. Um, because I, I, you know, I go out on stage here at Keswick every night and we are predominantly playing to a demographic that is um, heading towards blue rinse than uh, mm. anything else, which is lovely, which is great. Panto is introducing a whole new generation to live theatre. And if we get it right, they'll want to do it again. Whether or not that's the same experience the following year or what happens in this building when it's not Panto. Oh, I want to go and see that. Whether it's Gangster Granny or Cabaret or Chicago or whatever. We have got to get people through the doors that are ideally under the age of 40. Um, and I think Panto, obviously, does that. Now, whether that is literally just once a year and that's their annual visit to Panto, fair enough. But we are introducing um, that generation to a possibility that they perhaps didn't know about before. And if it's done well, as I said, with our underlying credibility, that storytelling of quality, then I don't really see how people uh, can be too snotty about it. Um, there is always the element of, oh, crikey, well, he's only doing it because he's off the telly. You know, why is he doing it? And that has always been the way. British Panto, you go back to the Drury Lane days, was created as a vehicle for the popular celebs of the time, the music hall stars, uh, to give them something to do over Christmas, basically. That's what, you know, the, the, the original Pantos, if you like, at um, Drury Lane, uh, that's their purpose. So we are just basically following the same premise. And, of course, the whole world of celebrity has changed a great deal. And there are people that I look at posters and go, really? Oh, God, you know. But if that in itself is getting people through the door and if the product has that integrity and quality, then it's got to be a good thing. This is about the continuation of live theatre. And I think Panto plays a hugely important part in that. Have you ever been in the position where you've seen a, a cast bill or whatever, <clears> either <throat> seeing it or even performing with them and actually being surprised that that person can do the job? Um, I think I've seen a couple. I can't remember being in one where I, I thought, oh, crikey. I mean, obviously, when, you're, when I was writing um, part of the creative team at, at First Family... Um, 
it was always the balance that we used to talk about casting the poster and casting the production and you've got to, you've got to have that balance and there were people that we cast that I think we would quite happily say oh I didn't go quite as well but we were always slightly aware of that possibility mm. so we would surround those people with quality trusted panto performers that we knew and we go okay well look they'll keep the the, the narrative going they'll drive they'll keep that pulse of, of you know energy through the show um and then of course the audience will see x y and z off of the telly and enjoy that um but i think i think there are people that um we use that actually like we all do like i did back in the day learned the craft when they came back and did it the second year and the third year and you'd mm. say <laughs> they've got it now that's it they've got it they what, know was that some of the americans perhaps, yeah, perhaps exactly <laughs> not and naming the, anybody no and it's <laughs> true i mean bizarrely you know uh, well not bizarrely perhaps that's why they were there in the first place they did incredible box office but the first year they go mm, they haven't quite got it but they wanted to come back and do it again and i have to say there wasn't one of them wasn't one cast member american or otherwise really that didn't want to understand it better and to get better and i really do think they all did they all come back and said i see what you mean now i see what you mean if i reference what the audience are expecting me to reference then that's not breaking my character that's actually just letting them in a bit more and it's what they want you know the so the fourth wall thing a lot exactly. of them didn't, no. didn't understand and it. they said well no i can't i can't do that that's you know i don't want to refer back to what i'm known for i want to be playing this role and you go oh honestly it'll be a lot easier to play that role if you just do that and once they had discovered that it they were desperate to come back and do it again right then i'm now trying to think along the lines of um are you okay to talk about first family and the closure yeah. of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> because uh, mr woods agreed come on as well oh good at some point oh, because he's down in dover yeah. is it dover he lives or? deal dover. deal dover. De de yeah St. Margaret's I'm, Bay, I'm getting him and hendy as well different oh, different times oh, but, um, yeah. it's going to be interesting to yeah. hear so how was it then the closure of first family to yourself as a performer um sad uh if i'm honest um i think that in its what was it 12 years it really did um create its own brand uh made an impact and i think potentially upped the game panto wise uh we certainly didn't get everything right every year um there were always things that we would go you know back in the office uh, end of january beginning of february and go Right, I see what happened there. We didn't see that coming, but we should have done. So let's avoid that next year, you know. So <clears throat> it it I think it it ended up getting an awful lot right and was hugely um appreciated by the audiences. Um it was a great team. It was a wonderful team. Um a lot of credit for that has to go to Kevin Wood, who was the the boss who I had first worked with uh, when he ran Kevin Wood Pantomimes and I'd done a few shows for him down in Canterbury at the Marlowe, the old Marlowe before it was beautifully redone. Um, and uh, he got a great team round about him and I was very grateful and glad to be part of that. And I think it was a real shame um, when, uh, because of various situations, ATG, of course, who were the parent company, yeah, first family had to go um now obviously i'm thrilled and delighted now to be part of the kudos family under uh, michael harrison and jonathan and nick thomas of course and i'm really enjoying working for them uh but i'm sure they won't mind me saying that i was and still am very fond of of my time at first family and what we achieved would you ever like to start producing yourself um i don't know i've i've worked as, as a, a producer with uh with a colleague and we've we've produced a few things and they've, they've gone all right and gone well 
but it's a whole different ball game. You know, it's it's giving up the creativity to concentrate on the logistics and the finance, you know, mm. which of course, as a producer, is the is the is the key. So maybe, maybe, and uh, I'm going to talk to a friend in the new year um, about a couple of potential projects as as producer. But at the moment, I'm still enjoying the creative side. Not that producers aren't creative, but you know what I mean, the acting and the writing and the writing. Of course, any producers listening. Exactly. You've got to be very careful what we say. That was my get out of jail card. <laughs> <laughs> and what about other pantos? Do you get to see many others around the country? Um, the past few years, not not a great deal. Um, I always say, oh, I'll, you know, there's... There's a few shows obviously still going on after I've finished. I'll go and I'll go and see them, and then it gets to January the ninth. You think oh, the last thing I want to do is <laughs> drive to Canterbury or Cluid or Bradford or whatever. So I do see a few, uh, and I have to say I've really enjoyed it. Once I'm there, it's the thought of getting out of the armchair um, <laughs> it, to go. But I've always really enjoyed it. Uh, this year in Manchester, we close on the 29th of December which is the earliest I've closed. Um, so, yeah, I will be going. I'm looking forward to going to see a few um, shows in, in January. So, yeah. But I always go with some friends over to Monte Carlo, middle of January, to a big circus festival that happens over there. Um, and uh, that's my sort of post-panto treat. And just go for a few days of circus and Chardonnay. <laughs> Do you suffer then with the panto blues, or are you quite happy to see it sort of go? <laughs> um, no, I don't think it's it's panto blues. I think it's literally uh, more physical than mental. In that, once it stops, my body uh, has certainly in the past uh, kind of shut down. And the the girls are. I always used to, and I think a lot of performers will will um, agree with this. You you do get ill. Your body goes. Oh, we're not we're not doing that anymore. All right, we'll have some of this, and you go. Oh, damn, I've got a cold. Oh, God, I'm aching. You know, so uh, literally, my, as I said earlier, my daughters talk about my post-panto coma, where I just sit in my armchair and they work around me for a week, uh, which obviously is awful, as you can imagine. I hate it. Uh, <laughs> and then I go off to Monte Carlo for a few days. So it, um, it it's hard work, but I, I don't think I get the post-panto blues because I, I look back... And it's funny, I won't get that this this year because I'm working from home, but I always enjoy the drive back after the last show of a panto, like last year from Darlington or be it from Bristol or wherever in past years. I always enjoy the drive back because that's when I do my little um, post-mortem of the run and think, oh, yeah, that was good. Oh, no, that wasn't. Oh, I won't do that again or whatever. Um, and I place everything as much as I can mentally. But I'm always thinking, yeah, that was good. Another another year gone by, I've learned that, I've achieved that. I'm looking forward to not doing it for a few months, but oh, I'm, I'll be doing another one next year and I'm looking forward to it. Is there anything you don't like about pantomime? Three show days. I haven't done one for a few years. And I just, I, I've got to be honest, I, I don't think I'd have the energy for it now. I really don't think. That was when I was first introduced to Red Bull. Uh, mm. by Colin Baker down in Canterbury many years ago. Uh, and I can see why <laughs> why it exists. Uh, I find them very hard. Again, they're only done because they are the shows are selling and there's a market and a need for them, especially in smaller venues who have to cram in as many performances um, to, to make it financially viable. Um, but I do think if you, if you do too many, I know there's a few shows where three show days almost become the norm during the golden period. And I think that can be almost counterproductive because you're just dealing with an awful lot of very tired people, both on and off stage. And I have seen one show where I really think that was the case and the production suffered. Mm. Um, but there we are. That's More the quality. The, yeah, 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 yeah. That's back to the old um, producer's... Uh, problems uh you know it's it's got to be financially viable for them of course um but i think you do need to be slightly wary of overworking um cast and crew and what do you do when you get the winter snuffles uh well i am uh 
sponsored by Barocca from about <laughs> now onwards. I start taking it now um, and building up the old vitamin C. Um, I, Jakeman's sweets, of course, I think. And it, it's almost impossible to avoid. You know, you're in a building going from hot to cold. The building is, even before the audience get in, is normally full of kids. The Jews running around sniffling and, you know. And it, it's inevitable. And to be honest, if I come out of a panto having just had a cold, I consider myself lucky. Because, you know, we've all heard stories of people doing a scene rushing off to be sick in the mm. wings into a bucket and back on, you know. Um, so I think probably that the, the winter winter snuffles is <laughs> is. I think if you can get through to January having just had that, you're probably going to be all right. Have you ever missed a performance? I did. I've only I've missed uh, two shows in one day in Bristol a few years ago, and I got the most awful stomach bug. Um, literally just woke up that morning and thought, oh, my God, what's going on here? And was just violently ill. <coughs> By mid-morning, I, um, I thought, no, I just, I just can't. Do I have no energy. So my understudy, uh, bless him, one of the dancers, went on, did a great job, had done his homework and um, knew the lines and knew the moves and by all accounts was fantastic. Um, so credit to him. I think a great number of safety pins were used in the <laughs> costumes to, to bring them in a little. I wouldn't have. I well, wouldn't believe you know, it. Wouldn't well believe obviously, it. dance is my life, hey. But uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it, uh, he did a great job. But on the other side of the, the, the story, I don't know if we've got time for this, I'm waffling on. Of course we have. Uh, when I was directing uh, Snow White up at the Kings in Glasgow a few years ago with the wonderful Gregor Fisher, Rabsi Nesbitt, who was playing our Hector the Henchman, and I'd, I'd um, written it as well. And we opened on the Friday, uh, two shows Saturday. It was great, it was going really well. And I was due to drive south on the Sunday to start Tech Week at Liverpool Empire on the Monday uh, for Dick Whittington, which I'd done and written and directed many times previously, and I was just going to be slotting in as Sarah the Cook, and my daughter had been in rehearsals as me mm. for the past two weeks. So on the Sunday morning, I was literally uh, thinking, OK, that's fine, I'll get packed in the morning, straight down the road, the show's fine. And I got a call at quarter past five in the morning, and you know the phone rings, you go, uh-oh, what's this? Somebody's... Mm. And it was uh, it was Gregor. With it. Eddie, I've got I've got nothing. I've got absolutely nothing. I don't know what's going on. And I go, oh my god. Uh, I said, okay. Well, look, uh, meet me at theatre at ten, and we'll we'll get the radio mic and we'll see. And he literally had just lost his voice, totally lost his voice. Nothing he was doing wrong. He was giving a great performance. Was looking after himself. Mm. He just lost his voice. And I thought, you know, as director, I thought, well, I can either put on a trembling 20-year-old dancer from Wolverhampton as the main character of the show, or I can stay and do it myself for today. Monday, obviously, was the day off, so mm -hmm. that would give Gregor two days to hopefully get sorted for the Tuesday performances. And I thought, I can't put poor John, the, the dancer, through it. So I stayed and did two performances uh, as Hector, and thankfully the audience, you know, the usual announcements and everything. And you could... <laughs> <laughs> you stand in the wings and you can hear the audience go, oh, the groan. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and you think, oh, well, that's natural. That, it's Gregor they've come mm. to see. He's top of the bill, you know, among everyone else. But um, yeah, so I, I've um, I've missed two performances, but I think I like to think I made up for it by doing two extra as Gregor Fisher. <laughs> it was how, lovely. How was it at the end, though? It was great. It was great. Thankfully, everyone had. Uh, uh, forgotten who it was supposed to be and I was you know I was obviously using my native Scottish accent and I was doing most of what Gregor did there were a few of his lines that were very specific to his characters and things but I, I did oh excuse me by the way huh? you know who do you think you're talking to you know so I managed to, to uh, bluff my way through <laughs> both shows uh, and then at the end of that um, I drove home got home about midnight and then was up at six to go over to Liverpool to Start oh, Tech Week. Yeah, Seemed mate. like a jolly good idea at the time, but it was it was great. Do you like Tech Week? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's all I have to say on that. Tech Week. Well, it's it, it's <clears throat> it's going to be a different experience this year because I'm not directing. Mm. Tech Week, when you are directing and daming, and there are many of us that do it, uh, is a case of running up and downstairs 
uh, to and from the auditorium uh, going, oh, change that lighting. Why, why didn't that fire? Go back, let's do that again. Oh, hang on, I'm in the wrong costume, right? Just give me five and then we'll go back. We'll do that scene again. <laughs> or no, that's a quick change. So you need to go back, go right way back. Can we reset the pilot? No, we haven't got the budget for extra pilots. Okay, never mind. Never mind. So it's, it's, it's a different experience when you, you're multitasking. Uh, this year, I'm just looking forward to daming during the tech week. Rocking chair in the dressing room. Exactly. Going to be it. Exactly. <laughs> I'll be looking for scenes I could be cut out. So. No, I won't. Know. I'm really looking forward to it. I did um, Snow White uh, for Kudos a couple of years ago up in Darlington, and it's a great production. Uh, and I think we're having predominantly the same foundation of the show, but obviously around the wonderful Craig Grover Allwood, who is our Wicked Queen. I'm really looking forward to it. You're always popping up on the telly. Mm. Sorry. How did... Well, it, it's fine. I, I, I <laughs> said about it before we started recording, I said I, I'm a bit of a latecomer to Still Game. Oh, yeah. And you, I was just, that's Eric on the telly there. And it's just... <laughs> so very envious of that. But how did you actually start to get your break into telly? You mentioned about Corrie, mm. and then you got yeah, quite, well, I mean, quite a I, large part in Corrie. Yes, uh, Diggory Compton. I did two years as, as the baker on the streets which was which was lovely but Diggory was my fifth character in Corrie all the other four being one episodes you know over mm. 20 years or something um so yeah I mean I I it, it's literally just uh you know writing off to the, the television casting directors um when you're younger and you get, and now to be honest without again sounding too arrogant about the whole thing um they they know me and they <laughs> I've got a whole I I've uh, got a whole list of of casting directors telling me not to lose weight um, because I'm their fat bloke you know oh Eric don't lose too much weight if you see a breakdown on the program on an episode they go oh yeah Eric oh we'll get Eric in for that um, which is great but when you think oh I don't know I quite like to lose a bit of weight and I've, you know I've lost a bit of weight while I've been up here in Keswick um, it's the old balance between actually. You know, getting to live longer and <laughs> getting the parts. So I've been very lucky in that I have a lot of um, um, both television directors and television casting directors who now know me and do, bless them, think of me um, when they see the, a right role in a, in a breakdown. So that's uh, I've been very, very lucky. But it's such a different art, especially comparing it to Panto, Mm. Um, you know, it's the size of the pros arch compared to the size of the television screen. And I think it took me a little while to to get that right. I remember I went into Brookside for a couple of years, a long time ago, and I did my first scene with the director who'd cast me uh, from the from the casting meeting. And I did my first scene. He said, "Oh, cut, cut!" And he came up to me very, very quietly. Went, it's not theatre royal Hanley, love. Bring it down a bit, will you? <laughs> and you know, I still, I still remember that when I go into a studio, I think, okay, just bring it down. You're not, you know, you're not having to reach the gods. Mm. Um, it's a different art form, um, but one I, I enjoy. And you know, the past couple of things, I did some Emma Dale, and I did Lovely Casualty uh, last year, which again came through a, a friend, a director I'd worked with before. Um, and uh, gosh, what a well old machine that is down in Cardiff. It's great. Uh, so, yeah, very lucky to be able to do that. And I've just finished, I've been doing some radio, I do lots of radio drama. And um, they've been very good with me down at Media City and said, oh, we can record in the morning and then you can get back up to Keswick in the afternoon for the evening show. So, I've been able to do some of that, which has been, been great. What's your favourite part then of the acting world? Oh, crikey. There's a good question. I uh, am I allowed to? Yeah, of I, um, course you are. Oh, very kind. Uh, mind you, I bought you a coffee, so I suppose you, I'm allowed. You to. did, thank yeah. you. <laughs> you got a mug for it as well. So I know uh, the Panto <laughs> podcast mug. <laughs> I had wanted to play full stuff um, in Shakespeare for a long while, and I thought, you know, with my waistline, uh, I hope it comes round at some point. And I was able to do uh, full stuff in in Merry Wives of Windsor. Rather than the, the Henry V um, characterization, so I did that a few years ago, which I really enjoyed. It was lovely. It's something just about him that has a bit of a bit of kudos for my, to use a panto phrase. Uh, the other role that I really enjoyed, I think, is because I learned so much from it. Was um, 
a strange but thoroughly enjoyable little summer season when I was doing a lot of work at the Coliseum in Oldham. I got to know a lot of the local creatives. Um, uh, and we there was a, a, a tiny theatre, I think it seated like 120, above the library in a village called Delph, which is up one of the little Saddleworth villages. Lovely place. And uh, Jeff Longwell, another panto performer, um, said, oh, look, should we, should we do this? Should we put on a little summer rep season? And I played Inspector Ruff in Gaslight, old, you know, creaky uh, Victorian based melodrama thriller and he played the policeman uh, he was he was the policeman in that and I did it again you know I think we did it for a week and a half in this tiny theatre and I learned so much I don't know why but it was just I took so much from it that I it stuck with me I really enjoyed it and he's a great part a great part that of course and Sarah the Cook or Nurse Nora of course or Widow Twanky Where? So where did the thank you come from? <laughs> Anybody who's seen Eric perform, you're, but you're you're probably best off explaining the uh, when when you're doing your your. Moves. But yes, it's it's my it normally used in in the balloon ballet, yes. uh, which I normally find in in Aladdin at the um, uh, Abenazar's palace, and and uh, when he uh, Twanky is is interacting with the. Uh, musical director to get the music for the balloon ballet i don't know where it started i think it, it just i started just doing a normal thank you and then over the years that suddenly became a, you know uh, and it, it just struck a chord and it's bizarre i've had literally i walked it happened it must have been earlier this year spring literally walking through manchester and there was a, a mother and a child a little boy and they i could see them seeing me from a while a, a distance and i thought oh, i wonder what they know me from is it Doctor Who or Still Game or whatever? And the woman said, oh, "I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Could you could you just say thank you?" <laughs> <laughs> so I was stood outside Marks and Spencer's in Manchester. Didn't thank you, um, but yeah, it's just struck a chord. <laughs> Your involvement then with Roy Barraclough, mm. as well as being on the cobbles, you also took part in the. Uh, the play wasn't it? Was yeah, the play with uh, about Roy and Sissy and Ada. Sissy and Ada. Yeah. Sissy and Ada. Yeah, that was that was a, a, a strange one. I um, I I know, bless him. I, I'd known Roy for a good while again through Oldham, um, and we become good friends with him and his, his partner. And um, then this play come and and it was another actor that I'd worked at Oldham with sent me the information about this play, this casting breakdown for Sissy and Ada, a play about Les and Roy. <clears throat> that was happening, uh, of all places, at the Broadway Theatre in Barking. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I wrote off saying, look, I don't know if you're cast or not, but I've just seen the breakdown. It'd be interesting to, to talk if you wanted to. Heard nothing about it nothing back from them. I thought, oh, well, they've obviously cast it, whatever. And then weeks and weeks later, I got a, a, a message from my agent saying, oh, you've been offered this play. And I went, oh, crikey. I thought at least they'd want to see me or something. Anyway, uh, and it was to play Les Dawson, um, both as Les in the play and as Ada in the Sissy and Ada sketches. And we had... Um, Two other cast members, lovely um, Stephen Arnold from Corrie as well, was was in it, um, and uh, to, uh, Tasha Tasha McGeeky uh, was a lovely actress. Was one of the other roles, and Steve Nallen, best known of course as um, Thatcher in Spitting Image, mm. was playing <laughs> Roy's part. Was playing Sissy, and we had a great time. And it, it really was um, a great play. It was well written uh, by Graham Warriner. And we we got to do all these wonderful old sketches, and that also uh, the rest of the narrative as as Les, and I, I didn't set out to do an impersonation of Les, but his his vocal patterns because he was such a wordsmith, they're so specific. You find yourself just going into the flow of of how he spoke, and you know he put pauses in certain places. He, you wouldn't necessarily put elsewhere. And you, you sort of think, oh, yeah, that's right. Steve was great at Sissy. And we did all these, you know, these sketches, um, which are just a joy, the art gallery and, you know. 
the doctor surgery and all that. Were you Virgo intact? Oh, no, we were just bed and breakfast. Uh, just wonderful, <laughs> wonderful stuff. Um, and uh, it then went from there. We were, then did a tour. Uh, and some venues we packed out. The Lowry, we absolutely packed out. Lowest off, we did less well in. I think we played to about 40 or something. It was a show at the lovely theatre down in Lowest off. But it, the tour did well. And uh, it was a great show to do. And when we were doing the Lowry, if I can indulge a little here, um, we had a, a post-show sort of informal party. And I uh, was pulled aside by someone. They said, oh, I want you to meet someone. And it was Les Dawson's daughter uh, from his first marriage to Meg, who, you know, dad sadly died mm. of cancer and was that was dealt with in the play. And... Uh, she said, I don't want to take up so much of your time, but these, these are my children. And I just want to tell you that you've introduced them to their granddad. And I said, oh, God, I'm filling up now. Uh, it was a wonderful thing. And she said, I just told them to close their eyes and listen. Uh, and you, you, you nailed them. And I was, oh, I thought, oh wonderful. I said, because I said, I wasn't, that wasn't what I was trying to, trying to do. But it, you just can't avoid his... Uh, and it was a real skill. It wasn't art. His his speech patterns and his delivery and his manner, and just to have had that comment was was wonderful. It gave me a real boost, as you can imagine. Um, and actually, I mentioned Lowestoft. I know why I mentioned Lowestoft because in the foyer at Lowestoft, they have a piano that belonged to Les Dawson, or certainly that he used a lot on. Mm. So I was able to have a little tinkle on that in the foyer as well. Did you play it better than Les did? Uh, no, I very much doubt <laughs> I did, but for all the wrong reasons. Uh, I mean, obviously, for him to play the piano the way he did in his act, he was uh, a great pianist uh, to begin with, and then, of course, got it wrong. Um, and it was a great part of his act. But it was a great play. I was really, really pleased um, to be doing that. Be nice to see it come back round again. I think a lot of people would like there's, to see that. There's a little bit of conversation happening, uh, possibly for next year, if not the year after. Um, certainly in Manchester, but I won't say any more than that. Oh, <laughs> but it's certainly something and yeah, exclusive. exclusive here on Panto <laughs> Podcast. Um, yeah, so uh, that, I do hope that happens because it was it was a great play. It's certainly a part I'd I'd love to go back to. What would be your advice then for? young people trying to break into the business um the business as a whole or, or panto specifically bus the business the business as a whole the business really. as a whole um <clears throat> don't and i'm trying to say this in a very non-arrogant way but it's it's from my personal experience don't expect it all too soon don't think you know it all learn soak it up Listen. Listening is a dying art these days. And I see it around me. And I see some young performers who are lovely people, really lovely people, and actually who are very good performers, but they don't listen. And it's it, it's a key. And I can remember back to when I was just out of college and I was desperate to hear what was going on. It's not about eavesdropping stuff you're not supposed to hear. It's about actually just tuning in to what's happening around about you and seeing if you can learn from that. And I think 90% of the time, you can. Uh, even if it's a word you've never heard before, a specific theatre word, or a, a, a style, or a feel, or a, a directorial note, or whatever. Just be ready to keep learning once you think you've finished learning. Because there's, there's not a job that I leave at the age of... 53, 54 on Friday, uh, that I think I learned nothing from that. And I think if I do get to the stage where I think, oh, well, what did I take from that? Then I'd be, I'd be looking to change careers. You can always learn. And I think when you're young, you've got to accept the fact that you are still learning. And it might not, that might not be, you know, cool, but it's the business. Is there anybody you latched onto when you were younger to kind of see as a mentor well uh, certainly f with um, a specific uh, feel of panto it was Kenneth Allen Taylor mm. uh, not just from the point of view of, of being a dame and watching his dame but the whole genre of panto 
uh, he 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 knew it. He knew what would work. He knew what wouldn't work. Uh, and more to the point, he would know why it wouldn't work. You know, and I've still to this very day, I stand on stage, and I hear his voice. I hear him going, "Don't over egg the pudding. Stop there. No, no, there is another gag. But stop, stop, move on. Don't over egg the pudding." Or just give it another second. They'll come there, and I still hear him to this day. Um, and just someone like that is just worth their weight. Uh, and that's what I mean about soaking up and listening and learning. Uh, he would very much be my my mentor, uh, and he may well be one that well, not may well. He definitely would be one that is worth getting on the Panto podcast. Because his uh, encyclopedic knowledge of Panto is worth listening to. Thank you. Well, this leads me on to my very last question, mm -hmm. which is your dream pantomime. You can be in it. Mm -hmm. You can direct it as well if you wanted to. You can choose the venue and your cast, alive or deceased. Oh, now there's an interesting one. Well, I mean, obviously my heritage kind of dictates that I would love to see um, a great panto up in, in Scotland. But I think I'll, I'll broaden it. I mean, I, that will be a separate list, the Scottish one. But you I can think, have two then. Oh, can I? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, all right. well lovely. I, <laughs> King's Glasgow is just the most stunning venue. I love it to bits and it's so cared for by everyone up there. So, And it has a real panto pedigree. Mm. Um, I would love to I probably I don't know maybe a small part in it but I would love to see uh, maybe this is a bit controversial I would love to see Ricky Fulton as Dame who I did see many times over the years Stanley Baxter of course is the iconic King's Glasgow Dame and is wonderful uh, but I just have very fond memories of Ricky Fulton as Dame and thought he was absolutely wonderful I would bring back the sadly, sadly missed Gerard Kelly, who was Panto Comic uh, at the Kings for many, many years and was dearly loved and left us far too early. And um, I would bring back Una McLean, who was a great um, Panto performer, um, and just do one of the, the old traditional Kings Pantos, big band in the pit, um, I'd love to pop Chick Murray in as a, as a you know an Alderman <laughs> Fitzwarren or something. He was he was wonderful. So I think possibly that's my Caledonian uh, panto. Uh, probably make it something like a Dick McWhittington or something like mm -hmm. that. Good tale. Down south, uh, so many beautiful venues. I'm so lucky. I'm going back to the beautiful Opera House this year, which I'm really looking forward to in Manchester. I love the Hippodrome in Bristol. I trained in Bristol and went see shows there. And I thought, oh, I want to appear here one day. I want to work here. And I've been able to achieve that in Panto and other things on tour. So I'm going to pick the Bristol Hippodrome, which is a stunning venue that's dearly loved locally. Many friends in Bristol. Also, my daughter studied at the university there, so that's special. I would now, you see, this is getting tricky. I would love to probably direct it. Um, I would love, although I don't know... I don't think she'd do it anymore, but I had such a fantastic time a few years ago in Wimbledon with the glorious Dame Edna Everidge, uh, who was just the most wonderful performer, but also the most wonderful person, um, a.k.a. Barry Humphreys, of course. He was just the world's nicest man, and we had a great time, and he, I'd written it and was directing it and was daming. And I didn't think I would get to dame with him appearing as Edna. And he said, oh, no, you must. You must. We've got to have frock envy. We've got to have all that. I said, no, but that's your thing. Oh, no, no, no. He was playing the fairy character, if you mm. like. Uh, Dame Edna, saviour of London. So I'd love to get Dame Edna in to the Hippodrome. Um, I have very fond memories of the Hippodrome. Uh, kind of topical of the wonderful Barbara Windsor, um, who was just a joy. And she was another one who would listen in the wings constantly constantly and she'd come off she got you changed it you said you said ointment instead of talcum don't change it don't change it. the talcum's funnier and she was always right damn <laughs> um but i had a lovely time down there with barbara and her husband scott 
Uh, so I'd like to get those two in and, you know, just some of the, our wonderful homegrown pan panto performers. Uh, Billy Pierce just works so hard. Um, it'd be great to, I mean, you know, he's just doing sterling work year after year at the Alhambra in Bradford, but it'd be great to get him in his comic. What an energy, what a drive. Um, John Chalice is a wonderful baddie. I've, I've worked with John, who's great. At, at the same token, Robin Asquith, uh, who I worked with last year in Darlington, was a great baddie with lovely comedy as well. Um, so, yeah. And, and roundabout, if you like, the names. There are so many trustworthy, hardworking panto performers that churn out year after year and are just so reliable um, that we used a lot of FFE that we were talking earlier about being the motors that weren't necessarily on the poster but you knew they were going to deliver. I'm thinking of Samuel Holmes who's just the most wonderful performer and has of course done so much more than, than Panto at West End all sorts of works and love and dearly. Um, uh, oh crikey there's so many you know Paul Anthony Houghton a lot of the names Ben Goff um, worked with us for some so really strong panto performers and I think it's important that we get a few of those in as well as our casting the poster we cast the production as well really good people what would be the production so my favourite uh, is Dick Whittington so I think we probably would get um It'd be, it'd be tricky because I want both Dame Edna and Barbara or Babs in there. So they'd be vying for the same role. So I think we'd probably have to get Edna in as fairy and we'd um, we'd make uh, Babs uh, maybe a uh, really written up ship's captain or something like that. Hmm. Um, we get Billy Pierce in or Andy Ford, of course, a wonderful panto performer from the Hippodrome. They'd be in as comic. Um, would I do Dame? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe get Biggins or someone in to do them. And uh, all my uh, hard-working panto chums round about them. What? I think that sounds good. Eric, can I get a ticket, please? Certainly. Thank Certainly. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric, thank you so much for taking part in the Panto Podcast. A real pleasure, and I look forward to enjoying my tea up here in Keswick for the next seven weeks out of my Panto Podcast month. Panto Podcast.